Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm Matt. I teach at Greenville University. Uh, my research interests are media archaeology, cultural theory, and talking about socialism. <laughs> I'm Dean. I'm a Catholic PhD student at the Institute for Christian Studies in Toronto, where I work on media theory and politics and religion and uh, all, all the good, good stuff. This week on the show, we're talking to Michael Jimenez about his book, Remembering Lived Lives, uh, a really neat book about uh, Christianity, decolonial theory, and uh, what is to be done (laughs) about all those things. (laughs) Um, Anyways, it's a really neat book. It's in Wiffenstock. Go check it out. Um, 10 out of 10 would suggest it's uh, pretty neat. So if you're playing the Magnificast home game, pause this episode now and wait three or six days before this book can get to you. <laughs> uh, anyways, it's really cool. Uh, I can't stress that enough. It's a it's a great book. Uh, if you're a person who likes theology and uh, you think you might like decolonial theory, but you aren't sure, this is a book that you can pick up and uh, you can really get into it. It's a really helpful introduction to a lot of the uh, big ideas uh, regarding decolonial theory and uh, theology. Yeah. Yeah. Also really, uh, really cool because... Um... It's written in a way that I feel like would probably appeal to kind of like an evangelical audience and folks who are maybe not too prone to get involved in decolonial stuff. So it's a it's just a really, really neat thing that exists in the world, I feel like, for that reason. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's also just like not like a, a tough read. I think it's pretty accessible. So, yeah, there you go. Suggest it to all your friends. Buy it for your mom or some someone else. She'll say, thanks, son or daughter. Uh, I don't, I'm going to put this on my nightstand. <laughs> that's, what the, that's what your mom will say. That's what all moms say. Um, <laughs> cool. Before we get that far, though, um, we uh, we don't have any iTunes reviews to read, but we got our very first ever um, physical piece of mail for the Magnificast this week, and that is the <laughs> strangest thing to have ever happened to me. I went to my mailbox, opened it up, and there is a letter addressed to the Magnificast. So... Historic event. Historic event. Um, we're going to put this in the archives, so in the future, when someone's writing a uh, research paper about the Magnificast, they'll have this to sort of refer back to. Yeah, it'll be in the, the Magnificast time capsule. Uh, we'll we'll bury it somewhere cool along with uh, a button and a, a t-shirt that we forgot to mail out. Uh, yeah. Um, and also, um, we'll put our microphones in there when we die. So, <laughs> historic. That's right. We'll get them gilded. Golden microphones from the best podcast you've ever heard. Never able to be used again. (laughs) Because now they're covered in gold. Uh, Yeah. Magnificast time capsule. All right. Well, anyways, uh, thanks. uh, Shout out to James who sent us a uh, a quick letter. Let me just quickly describe this letter. I opened it up and it's a small postcard. Uh, On the front of the postcard is a... uh, a wonderful illustration of a beautiful red fox, uh, my favorite of all animals. I don't, well, <laughs> I guess. I don't know. I don't really have a favorite animal. but I can't say that I've ever heard you talk about red foxes, but, I mean, you could change. Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't not like them. So, it's an animal That's I enjoy. That's about the same thing as having them as your favorite. Yeah, I think so. It's not much space between those two points. So, on the front, <laughs> there's a red fox, and then inside, uh, there's a short note that says, Matt and Dean, thank you for the shirt button and endless labor you're welcome um here is a glorious red fox that eats chicken shit fascists yours truly james so thank you james <laughs> for this wonderful depiction of a fascist eating fox i think it's really important uh that we kind of capitalize on the imagery of this red fox as something that eats fascists um this fox eats fascists <laughs> so we've been told yeah 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 <laughs> so that's cool. Um, I, wow, did not think through the potential uh, sort of ramifications of having my actual address on some of those T-shirts and buttons. But now it's all coming back to me about why maybe that was a bad <laughs> idea. I mean, this uh, this letter is uh, the best possible outcome, but uh, somebody else could come egg my house or whatever, and that would be great. So no one egg uh, my house. <laughs> yeah, that's bad news. You can't egg a P.O. box. That's what they always say. They're always saying that constantly. That's like the sort of old adage about P.O. boxes. Oh, can't egg them. Yeah, Barney Fife, he said that in every episode. You can <laughs> egg a house, but you can't egg a P.O. box. Oh, <laughs> uh, man. Yeah, I think I remember that episode. Uh, all of them. All of the episodes of uh, Andy Griffith's show? Yeah, Andy Griffith's show. Yeah. Ugh, love that yeah, Barney Fife. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right, well, let's get into cool. it with Michael. Uh, 
Um, great. So, Michael, thanks a ton for agreeing to be on the podcast. Uh, we got a chance to read your book ahead of time. Thanks, Whip and Sock, for sending that to us. That was really helpful. Um, and we both had a really good time reading it. There's a ton of stuff to talk about. Uh, you cover so much ground and so many different authors. It's, uh, it's almost hard to know exactly where to start. Uh, but we're going to find out. We're going figure, <laughs> to figure out how to start. Um, in the meantime, uh, maybe we could just start by catching up a little bit and uh, asking you, how is it going? What are you up to over there in, uh, in L.A. these days? <laughs> um, yeah, things are going great. Uh, weather's, weather's awesome right now. And um, I've been pretty busy. Just uh, I got this uh, um, piece on Che I'm doing for the uh, Western Region AR so I've been researching that, looking at at um, the way he's used as a kind of a Christological icon um, in like a lot of different areas. So at first it was all like Latin American stuff I was looking at, but now I've been um, looking at like people like Norman Mailer and how they they saw him and Castro. So it's you know looking at more of the American context because you know a Cold War dynamic where it's like you're either you're communist, you're bad, and if you're not, you're good. And that that kind of uh, you know, became that framework. So I've been looking at that, and I got a piece with uh, Sojourners Magazine. I'm writing about um, myself and my dad. So I've been working on that kind of little popular piece. I don't, you know, haven't really done before. So it's kind of <laughs> experimental. Um, but yeah, so that's that's basically yeah, kind of the stuff that flo- kind of flowed out of the book, honestly. Nice. That's awesome. That sounds great. I really want to read what you have to say about Shay. That's awesome. I'm so excited to even think about that. <laughs> yeah, it's, it was really weird. Like, I uh, and a lot of it was in like uh, you know Chicano literature and and uh, Latin American like cultural uh, literature. It was like what was really weird about it was it was like right after he died, they're already talking about him as like a Christ figure and and all these poems and odes to him. You know, that's that just to me, it just seems weird that somebody can catch the. Uh, the um the imagination of artists across the world you know especially you know some like <laughs> guerrilla fighter from you know argentina who pops up in cuba you know it's 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 a it's a, the whole chain thing is such a weird phenomenon <laughs> yeah yeah for sure uh well we'll be on the lookout for that 100 <laughs> percent. yeah for real um yeah matt what have you been up to in southern illinois yeah it's uh cold as hell here it's freezing it's the worst um, it's not like LA whatsoever. <laughs> uh, so I've been freezing my butt off. Uh, it was my son's birthday really recently. So, uh, we've been, uh, giving him presents and eating cake. A lot of that going on. <laughs> um, had a really cool class this morning where, uh, my students are making some podcasts and, uh, super excited about those. Um, it's, it's really, uh, it's funny. Like, I don't know. I'm teaching my students how to make podcasts based on like my experience making podcasts. And it turns out they're all better at it than I am. <laughs> so uh, that's cool. Uh, it's really awesome seeing your students succeed doing things. So it's fun. Yeah. That's what do you have to Dean? Uh, well, they're also bad. I hate to break it to you, Matt, but um, it's worse here and you're you're coming. So sorry. <laughs> if you think Southern Illinois is bad, uh, Ontario is not friendly. Um, we actually had a, a giant uh, snow dump uh, yesterday and the day before. And apparently we're going to have another one this weekend, but... Uh, I like it. I feel like winter with snow uh, makes more sense. When it's just like cold and gray, I just feel like I'm living in a like gross flashback or something or like a bad, bad movie dream or something. So it's yeah. good to have a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't know, change of scenery. So I dig that. Well, um, <laughs> apart from that, not not too much except for the Christians for Socialism chapter in Toronto uh, got going in the last week. And that has been super, super fun. So Got to meet people and chat uh, with a few of them about what they, you know, why they're Christians and why they're socialists, which is really fun to have those kind of casual conversations. And um, it turns out, like, some of the people who came to the meeting and some of the people I'm emailing with, uh, they were aware of CFS back in the 70s and 80s. And one of them um, actually brought me uh, some literature that he had held on to for, like, 40 years. And he was like, you can totally have this and use this and check it out so that's pretty crazy um yeah yeah so pretty exciting exciting week anyway yeah that sounds awesome good stuff it was (laughs) (laughs) um 
Cool. So, warmed up a little bit. Let's uh, throw it over to you, Michael. We're going to put you on the on the spot here and ask you to do something we usually ask our guests who've written a, an article or a book and just give us the elevator pitch for the book. Uh, what's the impetus for you writing it? What are you trying to do with it? And, uh, you know, what what's it about for the uninitiated? Okay, um, great. Uh, well, um, I was like your typical like, humanities major. I mean... Um, where you just like to read books and didn't matter if it was theology or philosophy or fiction, nonfiction. Um, I just really uh, just like to, to read a lot of stuff. And, you know, then you go into to college, university, and it's like, well, if you're going to study history, you're supposed to read this stuff and write like this. Or if you do theology, um, kind of the same principle. So I've, I've always kind of had the interdisciplinary, you know, thing going, um, even when I did, uh, you know, write, uh, for my theology classes. So, um, I, you know, got, was going through the, uh, PhD thing, um, was writing articles here or there, some on, uh, on Zizek, a lot on Bart, since my dissertation was on Karl Bart, um, and, as I was going through that, um, I just started to notice, you know, um, <laughs> what literature I was being assigned in class and, you know, kind of known as like the canon and um, being at Fuller where they really like stress uh, the worldwide church and the diverse church and all that stuff. Um, I start to slowly, um, you know, read voices outside of kind of the European canon, you know, and Bart's kind of like the, the one of the kings of the canon, at least a modern one. So that um that kind of corresponded with my own um journey about my own identity as someone who's a a son from somebody from costa rica so i started to read a lot more um latin american theorists and that led into um other writers um from across the globe so i became much more of a um attuned to global thinking um and uh you know start to challenge just the way i've i was just reading like a lot of europeans all the time um european men um mostly so um the book kind of came from you know the after effects of writing the dissertation spending a lot of time on bart but at the same time like off in the corner being exposed to all this uh kind of eurocentric criticism from writers like fanon and and uh debashi and mignolo and and some of these characters. So, um, as somebody who is a was trained as a church historian, Christian historian, I want to like um, incorporate those voices um, into uh, to my work, into my uh, my time in the classroom as well, and you know, expose uh, the typical American undergrad who has like no idea where anything is on the map um, to some of these uh, diverse voices. And um, in doing that, it kind of just challenged. Um, I felt like the way Christian history oftentimes seems real clean or it, it kind of sweeps under the rug some of the nasty nastiness of uh, the past, the present and probably the future. But um, also that within the Christian uh, tradition itself, it, it has so many of these voices already um, that have been, you know, um, prophetic. I guess you could use that term, you know, somebody like Dr. King. Um, and, and he was kind of a test case for me because I was like, well, everybody likes to mention Martin Luther King Jr., but he's oftentimes very, very uh, little read outside of a few speeches, which, you know, are kind of pulled out as like nice Facebook quotes. Mm -hmm. But like, if you know, I know Cornell West really goes big on that, but to like actually start to have students like work through the King literature and um, and others, you know, then he's just, a, you know, the most popular name, but you start working through all that kind of literature, you realize, oh my gosh, you know, there's all these voices already been here, you know, uh, liberation the theologians, um, you know, as, 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 a, as another connecting point. So they're all here, but for some reason, um, we often, as students, aren't, aren't uh, we don't read them, or at least aren't being assigned them. I know there's, it's changing, and people have been doing this already within, um, the seminary is an academy, but uh, my book is just kind of more or less, it's a little autobiographical to kind of show how I kind of um, start to, to read people like uh, Dussel and Mignolo and, and those kind of figures to kind of like say, oh, wow, you know, we're really Eurocentric here. So, yeah, that's, that's kind of the, the basis of it. 
Yeah, that's really cool. Um, I appreciate that that explanation. It kind of helps contextualize a little bit more about why you start the book off with Bart too. So that's cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's um, that's that's probably like the least favorite chapter. I know that's the one my wife like. Well, I want to read your book, and she's like, I, I don't know about this part. So. <laughs> <laughs> Just, it's like it ceased at that point. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Um, well, that's a really uh, a cool, helpful sort of interdisciplinary note then, too, on history and theology. Um, you uh, you say that uh, in the book that you, you want this to be sort of a conversation between those two fields of history and theology. Uh, what do you think these two disciplines can learn from each other and like how do they complement or maybe not complement each other? How, what's your perspective on that? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think like when it, it's – what I noticed is that theologians, sometimes theologians could be really good historians. And I found like, you know, I know the term is contextual theologies. I don't really like using that term. I mean, I know it's cliche. Every theology is contextualist, you know, gets thrown out there. But it's it's kind of true. It's the label that, you know, basically if you weren't European and a dude, all of a sudden your theology is contextual, like after the 60s yeah. up to the day. And, you know, I, you know, and I tried to do this in the book, I, I go through a lot of different um, of the a lot of these theologies and go like, oh, my gosh, all these people are so attuned to history. They all write from a space, you know, particular time and space or all paying attention to like their history, whether they're Native American or whether they're um, Korean or whether they're you know, a Palestinian. You know, they're they're really trying to like build their theology off of uh, a really good um understanding the history. So they're doing theology from a place, which again connects really well to um, what liberation theology uh, theologians were doing. Um, so theologians would be really good historians. So that kind of taught me that. And, and I try to trace some of that and, and then, you know, encourage, you know, theologians in general, like, Hey, you know, you, you might be writing from Europe or United States and, you know, um, you're writing from space. You're not writing from this abstract, you know, um, um, you know, up in the clouds, you know, you know, um, like, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, imitating Thomas Aquinas or something, but you're, you're, you know, pay attention to your own history and, you know, the history of the United States or, or the Cold War, or whatever, when you're doing theology. So I tried to use, um, I, I guess the, the, the theologians doing history taught me like, oh, you can, you can do this. So on the flip side of that, um, I found that historians aren't very good about talking about religion in general and theology, mm. sec, you know, as well. And so they kind of pretend it just kind of went away with the Enlightenment. So I've been kind of challenging that whole secular paradigm. Um, um, I know figures like Anna Jar um, was was helpful for me to kind of say like, well, you know, secularism is just kind of a code word for like, you know, this kind of Christian's. Uh, you know, another form like rational Christianity that that moved into the whole um, 19th century imperialism, colonialism, and up into you know Cold War dynamics. So, I you know I I get that whole idea that that theology is oftentimes there even within like American exceptionalism after the war. So I it's it's an advocate. I'm also trying to advocate the historians like you know come on theologians actually say some really bright things and you know. One of the things that 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 I I really I paid attention to was, you know, uh, historians will have a hard time like using Heidegger or even Nietzsche or somebody like that um, when they're doing history, but all of a sudden with theologians they just don't know what to do with that. And you know, people like Bart, um, for all his faults, was a huge historical phenomenon. Um, and same thing with like uh, the Cuban Revolution, you know, what happened with Latin America there. It's, it's, you can't divorce the theology and the religion from those events. And so um, I think historians have to do a better job. And, and it has there has been a shift. But I, I know sometimes they, they pull the old way. Well, I'm a historian. I, I'm only trained to read history texts and like step away. Um, and I think that's that's not right. You know, everything's up for grabs in history, um, you know. It, and so even same same thing with like religious figures, like if you think about the 50s and up to our day and age, somebody like the Graham, you know, like the Graham family, Billy to Franklin, you know, for better, or for worse, they've affected American politics for 50 to 60 years. And you can't just pretend it's just, a, you know, saying over there you do on the side. It's like has real like social political ramifications. That's what I'm trying to do with with uh, both of those disciplines. 
Um, I appreciate that there's a kind of interesting materialist bend to that, right? That uh, sea legends say things and they're actual people that live in the world that sort of have a <laughs> an influence on uh, the machinations of history. I think that's a, a really useful way of going about it. Um, could we... Uh, just to get some things on the table so on this podcast we've talked like we've referred to things like uh decolonial movements and that before uh but i don't think we've ever had anybody um really sit down and sort of introduce it uh for folks who've never heard of it and uh i i guess uh maybe it would be helpful to kind of just get some of those terms on the table before we kind of move a little further into what you're doing in the book um so challenging Eurocentrism and uh, working through decolonial and post-colonial literature, um, could you just kind of lay some of those, the, maybe those three terms out? You know, why is Eurocentrism a problem for Christians in particular? Uh, and then what is decolonial and post-colonial literature? <laughs> okay, uh, good. Uh, <laughs> well, they're very, you know, <laughs> it really depends on who you're reading at times, but there is kind of, a, I would say, a canon that develops within um, the late 60s, but definitely the 70s and 80s. Um, I, I, you know, I refer to Edward Said um, and in the book Orientalism, and that that really was kind of one of the books to kind of put um, all three terms in. Um, you know, kind of deals with all three terms, even though I don't. You know, it's it's so fuzzy if he's really doing decolonialism but definitely um orientalism um points out how so much of what academia does has been determined by modern european thought which is historical but oftentimes when you see it happen they approach it as universal so i think um most of the figures who are working within post-colonialism and, and decoloniality, um, go back to Columbus. I think, I think the whole 1492 paradigm is important. The fact that at that point you can kind of see the rise of modern Europe and the rise of modern European nation state. And in that process, you get things like, uh, the, the massacre of the indigenous in the Americas. Um, which then correspond to the enslavement of um, of Africans um, and that that whole triangle of trade that happens in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then at the same time, you have the expulsion of Muslims and Jews in, in around 1492 from Spain, which would had been part of Al-Andalus and this kind of Islamic uh, Spain, which, you know, literally you can see the roots of the... Uh, um, the rediscovery of Aristotle and and eventually the the so-called European Renaissance. So um, that that's also there. And then not to mention the the Portuguese in the Indian Ocean and introducing armed trading there. So basically, the the framework of the globe changes with with uh, 1492, and and you see the rise of Europe. And you know where a lot of these figures go is you, you can kind of hopefully maybe hear a little bit of Foucault back here. Um, and, and what I'm saying about the whole idea of power and knowledge, but most of these figures would say Foucault only goes so far because he's still working within kind of a Eurocentric lens. He's still kind of mm-hmm. only looking within Europe. He's not really asking like, okay, what's going on with the African who's become a slave and now is living in the Caribbean or what's going on with the indigenous who, you know, survived or who's now been impregnated by European Spaniard and now they're having kids and now in Spain they're like, you know, ra- uh, basically making um, poster boards on what kind of race you are if you come from a different types of uh, ethnicity. So all these like terms and identities and definitions happen within this uh, – this time period at the same time where the Europeans start to talk about universal truth, universal reason, et cetera. So um, basically post-colonialism, well, decolonial, decolonialism understands the, the framework of power that's involved in, in all of this all across the globe um, and how we're, we are kind of in the present still kind of living in that shadow. And so – it's this really hard um, game, game, game you're kind of forced to play in as, as you enter the world and understanding like, well, this is how the world's been shaped. So 
decolonialism is is a sense of trying to like remove or change the the rules of the game as much as you can and and at that point a lot of different authors vary because some will say well you can't escape 1492 it is it's in our dna it's in our it's in our history it, it's it's shaped everything it's shaped modern the modern nation state and its politics so the best we could do is understand it and try to like you know uh navigate our, our lives through it others you know you have movements that are going to be like well, we're trying to get to the pre-European conquest to like, you know, what, you know, what like Azatlan is, is in, uh, in like Latin, in, 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 in some kind of like, um, you know, more, uh, oh, um, in certain like Chicano theory, for example, where it's like, well, we can try to get to this, this pre-European time. So there's, there's movements, what I would call like movements of purity. They're trying to get back to the, the, the time before the Europeans came. Um, so it, it's it's a kind of complex term. I know, like historically speaking, um, in the '50s, '60s, and, and you know further, a lot of like previous uh, colonized states were going through uh, decolonialism. So I think that's oftentimes where it's, it's tough to deal with the theoretical side of it, where you you get you know uh, thinkers like Walter Mignolo who are, are talking about. It. Decolonial, decolonialism as a theory and then you have the actual historical like you know these independence movements happening in africa where they're trying to like okay get out of here <laughs> get the belgians out of here get the british out of here and and then try to like you know create a new uh form and system and you know that's that's been uh hit and miss for you know in the actual real historical uh um times so um, so that's, you know, I, I'm, I'm even going too long here, but that's where uh, I think the Eurocentrism comes in is once you understand that the world had been colonized by Europeans and, you know, you're like living in, in uh, Algeria, you're not learning your history, you're learning French history and the French language. Um, once you realize that's the situation and you move for independence and, and try to create a new now you're kind of moving into your trend. Then you, that's where you're navig you're negotiating, you know, how post-colonial you can be now. Um, so I think that's why, like in the '70s and '80s, it really it really uh, takes off because, you know, Saeed notices it. Uh, people are, are you know are reading Fanon more and and figuring the subaltern groups in in uh, India as well are are uh, you know hitting the stride. But uh, yeah. Um, Sorry, it's like my long-winded way of trying to explain this kind of complex situation. No, that's fair. Uh, it was a, it's a pretty big question to ask, uh, an unfairly large question to ask, <laughs> um, but I'm glad that we did. Uh, now we can at least check that box off uh, on the Magnificast, so that that's a good thing. Um, could you uh, maybe say also a little bit about liberation uh, in terms of liberation theology and philosophy that you work with, uh, and then also how that relates to liberation movements in the world? So you just were talking a little bit about um, that differentiation between decolonial theory and decolonial movements, uh, projects. Um, is there something similar happening there with liberation theology and liberation movements? Uh, do you think that's a little more complicated, or how does that work a little bit? Yeah, well, I th I think it it does play into what I was saying earlier about history and um, theology. I know um, Hamid Dabashi has been really helpful for me, um, and then you know he he blurred my book, which was awesome because I you know read a bunch of his stuff and to have you know, somebody like you know write the back cover, you know, blurring my book was was really cool. Um, but he was helpful in kind of saying like, oh, wow, there's, as Lena, again, I'm kind of playing my naivete here, but I was like, oh, there's Islamic liberation theology. You know, mind you, I was just, you know, in seminary reading Cohn and reading Gutierrez, and that was kind of my first exposure. Um, so I started to read um, those, uh, you know, people like Ali Shariati and, and, and others because of Debashi and, and reading Debashi himself. Um, and then I saw, you know, like people like um, Lowy, um, I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, um, and uh, Sousa Santos, who who like looked at liberation movements in general and said, like, well, like liberation theology 
you know, this is a movement all across the globe, whether it's Islamic or, or um, Christian or Jewish or whatever. You know, this is like the actual beliefs on the ground for people. And um, it, there, there could be a really big unifying force here. So, you know, I think if you if you follow the old the old like um, spectrum where you're like, oh, no, you know, we're doing politics here. We're not doing theology and religion. It's it was a secular realm. We, we de- you know, we don't play that game. If you follow like that format that like, you know, some very strident seculars might have well you're you're not paying attention to the actual like belief systems across the globe or the way those belief systems are utilized so i think a lot has changed at least within scholarship and even within um you know these various theories they all of a sudden they don't you know they they don't want to puke when you know they see the word theology on the page or they see that you know oh wow Malcolm X is actually a Muslim you know where you know it's a what a novel idea and, and actually think like that really mattered to the way he's thinking about society and politics and not trying to divorce it to so I think liber I think the idea of liberation theology you know obviously it was a historical moment but I I feel like more and more theorists outside of like actual the- theological schools are paying attention to it as a as a um a system of thought i uh, you know uh, enrique Ducell is is probably the master at this at least he was for me to kind of um take this seriously look throughout <laughs> big swabs of history and understand how there's been these kind of liberation movements all throughout history and you know understand you know you go to the past and people are just aren't perfect in, in the way they you know, there's some flaws in her thought and there's some ups and downs or and stuff, but he kind of sees this trend of, of liberation throughout history that's always been there. Um and, and that's been helpful for people to try to, to resist uh um um destructive powers. Cool. That is maybe a, a good jumping off point to get into some like uh deeper questions uh, about your book and also about decolonial theory. Uh, this question is one I'm super excited to ask you um, and kind of hear you parse out for us. <laughs> so uh, uh, so like in, in your book, you make like a pretty interesting break with some decolonial thinkers, um, especially Walter Manolo, at least in my experience mm-hmm. in reading him. Uh, I'm not super well read in Manolo, but I've read a little bit. So anyways, this was interesting to me. Um, so you say in your book, uh, seeing Christianity or other religious thought as simply a foreign element shackled upon people across the globe denies the agency of individuals and whole communities the choice to be or not to be religious. Um, to me, this is like an interesting quote because um, in Manolo and sometimes in other decolonial theorists, they, they recognize the uh, European origins of religion as being like over-determining um, the agency of people. And like what you say here is exactly the opposite so there's kind of a break um uh, there's like a similar type of criticism that decolonial scholars make of marxism in latin america as well that it's like you know a a european ideology that answers european questions so it doesn't really work in south america or whatever um but uh do you think that there's like a similar judgment that we can be that we can make about marxism in latin america as well that um that you know we don't we shouldn't over determine it or is that a different story yeah no that's that's uh I think it's a really good analogy and, and a really good question um, because I, I think it goes it goes back to um, they clearly these thinkers clearly point out the prob the, the problems of of um, both Marxism and Christianity um, and I think the the first reaction from both circles the the more um, <laughs> You know the circles for purity are like, oh no, you know that was them. It wasn't all of us, and you know that was just a a flaw in in, in the, the movement or a wrongheaded leader. You know, not us. I, I, you know, we're the Protestants. We're we did it the right way, or we're the cast. We did, you know, what I mean, or it's like I'm not Stalinist. You know, don't, don't throw that on me. So I think um, there is this kind of knee jerk reaction to like to 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 say, well, it wasn't our camp. It was. Somebody it was the uh, fringe element or the heterodox or our camp that did it, mm-hmm. and so I don't, I don't, yeah. So I don't really want to, I don't want to make that that leap because I think I think this is, you know, it's it's important to understand like <laughs> the potential in in these movements. Obviously, in both Christianity and Marxism, is to is to do awful things. There's always that potential. History has shown that. Yeah. Um, you know, like and like any any ism, there's always a way. You know, kind of a 
probably a dark side to it. Um, I do think we have seen that uh, people can do both where they can be Christian or they can be Marxist or they could be Muslim and still um, work for liberation. I mean, again, you know, you can use Dr. King, you can use Cornell West um, and others uh, who, who have been, um, you know, have utilized the thought who didn't sweep the bad stuff under the rug. And I think a lot of sense they understand if you again, if you look at the, the um, various people across the globe, you know, religion is still something very powerful to them. And, you know, I, and so they are speaking to the crowd and they don't feel like it's something they just have to completely erase because they know better. I, I always feel like there's certain elements again in like, uh, I feel like the movement to purity, like, oh, it's all bad. Let's throw the baby out with the bathwater leads to almost like a, <laughs> I mean, I went, it, it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, but it's almost new atheist style, like, oh, religion is just bad, period. Right. And so you you start with that that um, presupposition and there's just, they, they give, they don't give an inch about anything. And I think one of the good things about history, I mean, it's, it can be really revealing how messy everything is and how mixed up all our belief systems are anyway, and just how much, you know, our, our, our isms crisscross with other thought and have origins in other thought. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, like I said, I, I enjoy someone like Mignolo, uh, but I always, I, I tend to be a little bit more closer to sell and trying to like salvage what mm -hmm. is of use in both traditions, whether it's, uh, uh, Marxist thought or Christian thought. I think there's elements there that's salvageable. And, and you know, again, like Cornell West is, a, is another good example of somebody trying to like <laughs> aggressively think through the problematic areas of it. And I think that's really helpful. Uh, I guess the reason it makes, um, the, the reason I was so excited when I read that bit in you, is, uh, in your book, was was just because uh, whenever I see I, like when we when we look into sort of history or we, we read the sort of documents that come out of these movements whether they are Marxist or Christian, uh, we see a certain like plasticity to these traditions that are supposed to be like hard rigid isms right like mm -hmm. uh, we we see them sort of adopted in different ways or uh, deployed in different ways. Um, the examples I always think to are about like are about Shea's campaigns in, uh, in South America and in Cuba. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like, uh, you know, it's, it's not like the, the communist party wasn't always on their side. Like they were the communist party wasn't always on the side of the guerrillas and, uh, mm -hmm. they, but they did something, you know, more it's, it's like, um, Marxism needed, I guess the sort of, uh, the, the rooting and sort of a different way of thinking even to be deployed in, in the place like Cuba or, or somewhere, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, and it's like <laughs> I think when you you boil down to it, you see the you see the struggles that are going on um, <laughs> behind the scenes, and and the way um, you know some people make decisions, and you know one group says, "Oh, you sold out," and the other one says, "No, you know it's it's practical. You got to survive." So, mm. you know, it it uh, <laughs> it, it kind of um, yeah. Again, the history is a lot more messy. Than, um, yeah. than, than, you know, the theories behind, um, behind, uh, you know, the big speeches and, and the, you know, the big, the big books that are produced there. Mm -hmm. But, um, I don't know, I, I guess I've, <laughs> I've always been kind of anti-purity when it comes to, you know, um, thought forms and a sense of like, and even like, you know, cause a lot of like biographies and, uh, are written about, you know, people I like in history, but I'm like, this is, this is, this, this saliness that's been per, kind of the halo put around this figure. It's like, it's not real. There's actually more interesting when you, you see the good, the bad and the human being. Cause it's like, well, it's kind of like the average Joe I know <laughs> down the street. Like we're all kind of a mixed bag of, of a mess. So, you know, better be honest about it. than then it's like, Oh no, you know, this figure, he's, he's just a great hero and he does nothing wrong. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's, totally faithful to the movement and he didn't sell out and blah, blah. I mean, it's, that just doesn't, that's actually not very interesting to me, I think. 
Yeah, you talk a lot about biography as theology in the book. And I think that's a really interesting way to kind of come at some of these problems. Uh, a couple episodes, we had this conversation with Marika Rose, where we were talking about Christianity's complicity um, in colonizing the world and creating a racialized world of white supremacy. And it's interesting to see people wrestling through how to deal with that, especially as being part of uh, a Christian community. Her response was, you know, well, you just kind of have to affirm that that's all part of what it means to be a Christian is to kind of own that. And it sort of seems like you're doing something like that as well. But I like this biography as as theology, um, you know, telling the stories of individuals in their contexts and kind of getting down into these kind of uh, micro stories that also help us kind of own those histories. Could you say a little bit about, uh, you know, what biographies as theologies do you think are especially useful for decolonizing Christianity and especially maybe... Uh, American Christianity. Okay, yeah, no, um, I uh, that uh, piece was written by James McClendon, who actually ended up at Fuller. I mean, he was long gone before I uh, showed up there. But um, that that kind of just appealed to my whole sense of like the humanities again. About oh, I can do history and theology together. I, I just liked the idea. Um, the problem I had was um, is something I know that I've, I've seen on the social media sites. It's like we have so little, like evangelicals especially, but like Christian Joe has so little imagination, so little knowledge about history, so that, you know, things are going crazy right now in the U.S., and everybody's asking, oh, my God, where, where's the next Bonhoeffer? Where, where's the next Bonhoeffer <laughs> moment? And I'm like, come on, <laughs> like, really? That's the only guy you can like pull out. It's like him, or you know, how can we like think wartime like C.S. Lewis? Like, it's or he gets boiled down to like those guys. I'm like, there's this whole group of, of people um, that we can appeal to um, and learn their stories. You know, I in the book I mentioned some of uh, people like Ignacio Ecaria, you know, who like got a, assassinated by the the Salvadorian junta in the middle of the night along with uh, a bunch of other people I mean, it was just brutal um i mean so you have people like that i mean that's just one person i mentioned who's like it totally inspired me um you know that that again kind of like moves away from just picking out the the cool popular you know theologian um that that just seems to be the knee jerk things like oh our bonhoeffer um, so I, I like the idea because it, it tries to get us to look at figures that, that don't just get enough attention. Um, you know, it's a book I, I'm just starting to read where they, they mention you know, figures like, uh, Abraham Heschel or for me, somebody, a uh, couple of people I want to read more is about the, the Berrigan brothers. Um, you know, your average Christian has no idea <laughs> and it's crazy because, you know, you read about it, it looks like it was pretty sensationalized when it happened. In the late 60s, early 70s, and today, like nobody has a clue. Everybody's like, "Oh, where's where's our Bonhoeffer? Where's our Bonhoeffer?" And I don't know. To me, it seems like somebody like uh, Father Berrigan would be a better somewhat appeal to, or Fannie Lou Hamer. Um, um, you know, I I thought James Cone's what James Cone's best book was probably uh, one of them is the Malcolm and and Martin book because I really think like there's something you know the average American should read is actually take these two guys seriously what they said you hmm. know not to make them poster boys for february but to go like oh wow let's see what the most famous muslim in american history has to say about something since you know islam's front and center in our news today or has been since you know for a while now uh -huh. but you know he's he's just kind of set up as this kind of historic <laughs> You know, in in the average American eyes, he's just this kind of foil that that's abstract foil to talk about Martin and 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 peace and 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 reconciliation. And I think uh, when you actually read the story of both figures, the good and the bad of both, you know, again, you flesh out real people that we can actually learn from and understand, like live theology in a really in really tough times and in, in historical times. So, um, so that's what I, I want to do with, uh, with that theory. I know, um, when McClendon did, he picked like, um, a composer and a novelist and, and, you know, um, he did pick Dr. King. So, you know, kudos for him for that. But I, I think <laughs> there's so many unexplored characters in, in the, uh, the canon that we can, uh, in the history that we can actually like you know, really utilize in our day and age and know, and, and it can be inspiring for people. 
Yeah, totally. Um, I think it's such a cool sort of methodology and process of, uh, I don't know, rereading our own story back through some different uh, voices and people and characters. Um, you mentioned this in your book, and you've also mentioned it sort of at the top of the episode, too, uh, about your own sort of autobiography as a motivator for a lot of your research. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? Like, how uh, how do your life and research intersect, and um, what, what does that look like? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, uh, I was really, um, like, again, taken aback when I went into school. I, um, I went a little later than usual. I actually uh, started at 10 Community College. I was a few years out of high school and kind of didn't have a lot of direction. I, but I ended up at a community college and I just started reading, um, you know, philosophers. I was reading like Camus and Sartre and Kierkegaard and stuff. I was just, I just wanted to kind of consume <laughs> ideas. Um, and then from there, that's where it kind of led to Barton Bonhoeffer and, and stuff. And then, you know, it, it was the autobiography thing where I was like, wow, you know, I've, you know, this, this I, identity and my, my dad's whole upbringing, which was rough. And I'm going to write about it in that, that soldier piece I was talking about. But I, uh, I, I kind of want to know my own <laughs> community in the sense of like, you know, grow up in LA and, and, you know, um, uh, you know, having a dad who's Costa Rican and having most people not know what the heck Costa Rica is <laughs> throughout my life. So I, I start to want to, uh, you know, read this other literature and, and, um, and, you know, apart from like, oh, you know, I have to read it because I have this Latin, Latino identity. More of it was I just started to enjoy it. It was just, you know, just like the time when I was an undergrad and, you know, reading Sartre and, and community college for fun. I was doing the same thing with uh you know, Latin American literature, Latin American philosophy, and just Latin American history in general. Um, so I, I think I, you know, the the sense of, um, you know, continually wanting to learn that I had, that thirst to, to just know, and um, and um, it just wasn't, it, it led me into, you know, places I had no idea I would be reading or writing about um, when I was like, you know, again, that kid in the, uh, community college. So I think doing all that and still remaining somebody who, again, sees uh, Christianity as uh, as a powerful force for good and for evil, understanding the dynamic, I think it's, it's been helpful in my own autobiography and, and the choices I make and, and my own understanding of my faith, too. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it sort of feels like that autobiography, um, you know, examining autobiographies is a a really helpful emphasis that you place in your book not just because you uh have a more unique situation than most uh you know having a dad who's from costa rica and being in la um but just by virtue of uncovering all those histories right like uh being able to sort of see how we're the products of those kinds of narratives um i feel like would hopefully help uh theologians in particular think a little more materially about what's going on in something as weird as <laughs> evangelicalism <laughs> yeah no no definitely and, and you know it's i think i know when i teach one of the first things they have my all my students do is write their own autobiography because i want them to like hey this is not what you're learning about in the, in the textbook or you're you know you're reading james baldwin this is not somebody this is somebody who like lived and breathed. This is stuff that happened not many years ago. Hmm. Um, and you know, so are you, you're you know, in a kind of Heideggerian sense of like you're thrown in the world <laughs> and then before you blink, you're gone. And I'm yeah. like, We're, we inhabit time and space and you have a history and to try to let them know, like you're, you're, you know, again, I, I don't think my, <laughs> my, honestly, my autobiography is very interesting. I, I, I always joke, you know, my conversion story, you know, it sucked. It's like, Oh yeah, I was first grade. And, my first grade teacher like said, you know, read, read a prior. I'm like, oh, okay, sure. Whatever. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> yeah, I don't have the great, like, you know, Pauline Damascus road story. It's just like, oh yeah, I read some books and I, <laughs> I like the stuff. So, you know, it doesn't have to be that, but I, I do want like the students to think like, yeah, you're, we're, we're here for this time. Other people were here. They cast a shadow over us. Um, and you know, we're all kind of in this together some way, shape or form the whole, like I'm the individual I, and, and I just do my will and, 
you know, it's that's it's uh, a <laughs> we could believe it. And in a lot of ways, we live like that. Um, but still, like family, culture, whatever, all that stuff, like it's just data that's framed to you are. So if I can get students to understand that, then, you know, they start to go like, wow, you know, I actually have a role somewhere to play in all of this. Um, so it makes history a little bit more dynamic. Cause that's been always my problem is like teaching, you know, <laughs> undergrad history at a community college or wherever. It's always like, Oh man, I have to take this boring class. Like history's so dull and <laughs> dates and like dead people and stuff. So I try to, yeah, I, the autobiography thing actually makes it somewhat dynamic for them and, uh, you know, makes them feel part of the story. Yeah, that's really cool. Dang, that's awesome how your teaching is informed by, I don't know, all of that background, uh, like stuff on decolonialism. Um, so maybe uh, this is a, a totally, this is a good Magnificast branded bad transition, um, but it's a, it's a question we have on the list, and I couldn't figure out a natural place to put it, so I'm just going to jam it right in here uh, toward right. the end of the hour <laughs> while we have yeah, a little bit of good. time left. <laughs> <laughs> um, so one of the things we talked to Marika about uh, in a, a couple episodes ago was the role that um, Slava Zizek, the Marxist philosopher, has in, in her work. And she has a kind of complicated critical relationship to him um, by virtue of his own Eurocentrism, uh, but she's also found a lot of a lot of use for him. And uh, that comes up uh, quite extensively in your book as well. And I know that you've done some other work on on Zizek in the past. You mentioned him even in this podcast. So uh, maybe you could just say a little bit about that. I mean, why do you think Zizek has been important to you? Um, why do you think he's important to so many? Christians and how does the decolonial uh, framework that you're exploring kind of relate to uh, that that work? Yeah, um, <laughs> that's great. Uh, you know, he was really instrumental in getting me to kind of think outside the box. I think I uh, I was when I started my time at Fuller. I just started to read um, a few of his like you know quote unquote Christian books. And I was just, I had so much fun because this guy was like <laughs> mentioning movies and comic books and all this stuff. And, you know, he was speaking my language in some way. On the other hand, you know, all this Lacanian stuff, I was like, I had no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> so I probably spent more time trying to decipher that and read books on Lacan just to understand Zizek than I probably should have done. But I, uh, I really ate it up. It was it was really um, exciting to me, and I I used to listen to you know I was was actually working at this little aerospace shop, like just buying materials, and I would just sit there with um, the YouTube videos going with him in all these different speeches. You know, it's his famous you know talks. Um, and I have to say, like the guy is is a master marketer. I mean, like who could sell like the same book a million times over? Where he just basically. Like, <laughs> <laughs> like co copies and pastes like 90% of the book it's like here you go <laughs> like like a dummy like me I like 30 of his books on my shelf they're just sitting there now I'm like dude you're saying the same thing over and over each book like that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> but um you know um then it got to point and I know this this happened to a lot of people <laughs> It got to the point where he really, like, I started to uncover, or not really uncover, but it was just kind of thrown in your face, like, oh, and he's trying to redeem Christianity. There's, It's definitely, like, uh, an, a, a kind of an appeal to this kind of Western-centric, Eurocentric thinking. And I think one of the things I, I thought kind of showed the, the – um, <laughs> you could kind of see that was just the way he never really engaged any kind of, like, liberation theology – so for like a you know Kirkcurry Marxist, he never really goes there. Yeah, I mean he'd rather, he'd rather quote Chesterton. So okay, <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I, I get it. It's a whole like you know subverting you know Chesterton, but still, it's like if if you're going to be kind of consistent with that, why not? And they call him out on Nelson and Maldonado Torres. I call them out on on that point. And then um, Mignolo and Debashi, you know, the kind of a famous. Uh, um, you know, go, you know, they, they kind of take Zizek to task and Zizek just basically dismisses them. It's like, ah, you know, I don't, I don't need to, why am I going to read that stuff? So that was kind of eye-opening to me, just the way he even handled once, 
you know, it gets once the thinkers from across the globe are like, hey, you're you're really Eurocentric. He's kind of like, yeah, so, <laughs> you know, I don't care. And why I want to read some random, you know, person from a, you know, quote unquote third world is he almost almost feels like he puts it that way. So I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, you've kind of you've kind of I feel like history has kind of moved past him at this point. Um, so I went in on that and kind of in, again, semi autobiographical kind of say like, well, I love the fact that, you know, G shit got me watching Hitchcock movies, but you know, in the long end, you know, kind of uh, to to be critical about even my own understanding of Christianity. But at the same time, I feel like I've I've kind of gone past that, um, and I think he's, it, you know, his it feels like even just I've been noticing his books and articles coming out. It feels like his best years are behind him. Anyway, I, some might say he went. He was got two enamored with Badu, which I I just never really got. I mean, I I to be honest, I did go see both of them when they were at UC Irvine once, and I had G Jack sign one of my books, and we <laughs> talk, actually talked to talked about Costa Rica for about thirty seconds, so that was weird. But um, outside of that, it's you know I've just kind of moved away from that whole that whole scene. Just I don't know. So yeah. that that kind of my relationship with the G Jack really. He's like a really wild character these days. Um, I took a class with him in my PhD program, and um, he, it was, I don't know, a trip, I guess. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, he's, he's. I mean, and I, I think that's, I do love the, the pop culture stuff. I mean, I, I think that's, that's the appeal. It's kind of fun. Um, he makes theory fun. I think that's why a lot of us were like really into that. Um, and then, you know, he, it's almost like he just gets this cycle where he's repeating himself. I mean, I, cause I do think like the stuff on Stalin, that's, that's a pretty, probably one of the stronger points, just the, the, uh, Stalinistic, uh, you know, how did Stalin happen? You know, this, this system should have went so well, quote unquote, and how did Stalin happen? I mean, I, I think that's probably one of his best points. Mm. Um, but like, yeah, he, I think he, you know, I know people, I, people much more, um, you know, who's who's who've a lot deeper in GJAC studies than me, um, they might be able to, <laughs> to understand what happened. But I, I just feel like it's almost like he, you know, he he almost became a parody of himself to some extent. I don't know. If you hang out with John Milbank enough, that they'll probably. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, That's man. true. It does seem sort of like a virus. Seriously, <laughs> why would you co-author a, a book with Bill Vag? It's like, come on, dude. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, cool. Well, uh, that's kind of a weird note to end on, uh, <laughs> but we are uh, getting at the uh, the end of the hour here, um, and just wanted to take an opportunity to say thanks again, Michael, for uh, coming on the show. It was a pleasure to read your book. Um, I hope that other people kind of check it out and pick it up. I think... I mean, there's so many good things to say about it, but uh, one of the coolest things I thought was that it's actually extremely non-threatening and uh, like very accessible and very good at introducing a lot of themes that are probably um, not only hard to, to understand, but also hard to just work through. Once you have understood them, they're kind of hard to deal with like the fallout of them. And uh, I think you, you provide a good maybe pastoral approach to, to dipping someone's toes into that kind of literature. So um yeah hopefully more christian historians uh christians interested in history historians interested in christianity etc <laughs> will uh will find the time to check it out for sure well, great well thanks i appreciate that this, is, this has been fun yeah it really has thanks so much yeah and let us know when you got that uh che article finished up yeah definitely well it, i'm i'm presenting in, in uh the end of march so i've been working on it so <laughs> but yeah definitely i'll uh i'll probably tweet it out yeah, that'd be cool. awesome. We'll uh, we'll retweet that for sure. Thanks for listening to the Magnificast. Thanks to Michael again for coming on the show. It was really fun. A uh, lot to cover, a lot of ground that we uh, got through, but also lots more that's still in the book that we didn't even get a, a chance to talk about. So please go check that out for sure. Um, we'll be uh, keeping up with Michael as he keeps writing all that all that good 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 stuff. Um, other news, we, uh, we've got a Twitter, uh, that's only news if you didn't know we existed for the last almost year. Uh, we are at the Magnificast. We've got a Facebook, we have a Facebook group called the Magnificast Basement. We have all kinds of neat conversations there. I've been talking a lot about China and the Vatican lately. That's the big Magnificast Basement conversation. So 
if you want to get in on that, you know where to find it. Uh, also, we've got a, a Patreon account, so if you want to support the kind of work that we're doing, uh, you know, whatever. We don't get paid to do any of this stuff. We just do it because uh, we can't can't stop ourselves from doing it. Uh, so <laughs> patreon.com slash... <laughs> couldn't if we tried patreon.com slash the magnificast uh you can you can help us out we'll maybe send you a, a little button in the future who knows patreon patreon released this new feature this week where you can like add uh pictures and like you can take pictures from your phone and like add them to your your patreon subscriber screen so uh they've encouraged uh, everyone to give give your patreon subscribers a, a peek behind the old curtain so you might get some of those <laughs> Some really yeah, great shots might. of like my computer screen. I don't really know what that means, but uh, <laughs> but you know what? You're gonna get them whether you want them or not. Patreon told me to do it, so I'm gonna do it. You got to do what the Patreon tells you to do. That's, That's just the, the law. Rules. Yeah, it's the law. Uh, yeah. Also, uh, Matt's Matt's coming in the future soon to Toronto uh, with this whole family family jam. So maybe maybe we'll get some some good secret Magnificat Instagram going. Anyway, thanks to Amaria Shea Armstrong for all the really good music in the show, and also to the Illogical Spoon who's going to play us out as always. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church, we'll meet down by the riverside. There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no damn between us and our Lord